Good evening. We shall explore the possibilities of a new security system for Armenia with Professor of Political Science, Narcisse Kopalian. Dr. Kopalian, thank you for this opportunity. My pleasure. The 2020 war exposed that Armenia's security system was either an illusion or it simply failed. Now the political segment is in search of a new functioning one. What do you believe is the correct formula of a security system for Armenia? Uh, well, Armenia's situation uh, in some ways is distinct, in some ways it's not too distinct from sort of other countries that have similar situations, have had or continue to have similar situations. And this falls within the category of small state security. And so when we look at small states that are uh, finding themselves in a security dilemma that Armenia does, uh, the sort of most uh, well-developed approach to addressing the security needs of a country like Armenia is the notion of a comprehensive security doctrine. Uh, this has become quite prominent with uh, the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries as well, uh, where you develop a security capacity that allows the, the uh, state to both address its external security threats as, uh, at the same time enhancing its domestic resiliency capabilities. So the comprehensive security model is specifically designed for states that have uh, limited resources uh, or, or sort of have the size specific issue and it allows them to maximize their capabilities uh, in addressing the security dilemma that they find themselves in. So traditionally, whereas Armenia uh, developed, instead of developing an independent security policy, instead of developing a, a security doctrine that would allow Armenia to address its uh, security needs uh, through its own capabilities, Armenia's model was one of dependency. Right. The concept is known as extended deterrence, where Armenia relied on a, a third-party security guarantor, in our case Russia, to address our security problems. That completely collapsed. And so when the Russia dependency structure collapsed, it became very evident that Armenia must have an alternative because the existing model no longer works. And this is the transition to a comprehensive security model that we talk about, which is very specific to the small state security capability model. Does it involve a non-block status? No, it does not. So the non-block status or the non-alignment movement that we've seen become quite prominent or was prominent maybe about 10-15 years ago no longer uh, has the same relevance that it had in the past. Because uh, at the global level uh, that basically entailed a polarized bipolar global system and either countries aligned with one of the poles or remained uh, uh, non-aligned with a non-alignment block. Uh, Armenia's situation is a lot more complex. We don't yet have the luxury of engaging in that discourse. We must first address our immediate security needs before we could talk about where our ideational uh, leaning is uh, with respect to the international system. But uh, a state to be able to implement a comprehensive security doctrine and to have robust resiliency does not need to be non-aligned. Matter in fact, most of these successful cases tend to be NATO member states such as the Nordics and the Baltics. Uh, Singapore has a similar model as well, and they tend to be relatively uh, part of the non-alignment bloc. Uh, Taiwan has something similar in that context, but they also happen to be under the US's protective umbrella. So uh, the, the non-alignment or alignment structuration really does not have much of an effect on, on the small state security doctrine. Dr. Kopalian, Armenia is on the one hand in need of an urgent security system. On the other hand, building a security system requires years of hard work. The Armenian authorities are going along the path of signing a peace treaty at all costs, obviously to gain time to build another security system. The opposition does not approve of this, but they do not suggest an alternative. Do you have an alternative to the peace treaty? while building a security system in the long run. Um, let's just say that those of us who engage in this kind of uh, study, specifically conflict studies and conflict resolution studies, are really not convinced that there's going to be a signing of a peace treaty. 
So uh, Armenia pushes towards a peace treaty because it is in Armenia's strategic interest to have peace through which we could build our security capabilities as opposed to being in a state of perpetual conflict which does not allow you to develop your new security architecture. This is the confluence that we're talking about. But fundamentally, uh, and I've, I've written extensively about this, uh, there are two mechanisms of establishing peace. There is a notion of liberal peace and there is a notion of illiberal peace. Illiberal peace is something that Russia and Azerbaijan excel at, which is another form of what we call authoritarian conflict management, in which case you really don't have peace, but you have periods of nonviolence where the given conflict is managed by the uh, more stronger actor. And this is what Azerbaijan prefers. When we're talking about a peace treaty, we're talking about the notion of a liberal peace, which is basically an equitous and fair peace that uh, addresses the issues of both sides. To assume Azerbaijan with the existing power asymmetry is going to agree to an equitous peace is really inconsistent with reality. And it's also not in Azerbaijan's strategic interest to do this. So when Armenia talks about signing a peace treaty, what we're talking about is we are working hard to signing a liberal peace treaty that in essence follows international norms and is fair and equitous. The fact that Azerbaijan has continuously obstructed this process is kind of indicative of where it's going. So the, 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 so the contention that Armenia is willing to sign peace uh, uh, at any cost in of itself doesn't mean anything because what constitutes this any cost? Armenia has basically said that we are ready to sign peace based on the existing terms. Are you saying that the peace process is doomed to fail? And if so, why are we moving there? We have to engage in a discourse because it is part of both the international political process and it's also part of the mechanism of at least deterring and curtailing Azerbaijan from further attacks. As we are building our security Absolutely. system, is this happening? It is a parallel process. Of course, Romania is building its security system. Now, the speed, scope and the publicity of it is a different conversation. But when you're talking about, for example, Armenia procuring arms in the last two years with close to the range of $4 billion, we're in the the last 10 to 15 years cumulatively you have not purchased that amount of weapons that suggests that a lot of work is being done when we're talking about military reforms of course it's a slow and complex process it's a slow and complex process in any country right but when you're seeing Armenia engaging with France on developing its special forces when we're seeing Armenia engaging in non-commissioned officer training and mission and command training with the United States when Armenia is developing further uh, military relations uh, on military science and sort of technical training with Greece and other partners this is indicative of a process that is uh, designed to be parallel with the peace process reforming and strengthening your armed forces while at the same time utilizing the peace process says to maintain uh, at least curtail Azerbaijan from attacking. So why would Azerbaijan give us the time to achieve alignment with, for example, France, India, Greece, the quadrilateral agreement that I'm um, that was theoretically. It doesn't want to. It doesn't want to. But Azerbaijan is curtailed by the international pressure and the red lines that the West has basically placed in front of it. And the, the 2020 incursion invasion into Jermuk was basically the pivoting point on this. And so when we're talking about the extensive diplomatic capital that Armenia has built in the last uh, two years and the, infl and the effect of Armenia's Western pivot and diversification policy that has enhanced relations with the United States, with the European Union, with France, all of these have served as sort of forms of, as a term I use is diplomatization of security. Uh, all of these have basically developed a certain level of guardrails that doesn't allow Azerbaijan to do what it wanted. So uh, these guardrails, these mechanisms did not exist prior to 2020 or 2022, they exist now. And this is what's limiting Azerbaijan from taking any more actions. I'd like to enumerate the recent steps of the Armenian government. Public criticism of Russia, shutting down a Russian channel, minimizing participation in OSCE. Why take this risky road of pivoting? Why not pivot backstage? A pivot uh, uh, both has to be uh, backstage Wouldn't or back channels. Wouldn't it be safer to pivot backstage? 
True, but then some things have to be structural and public. Uh, for example, freezing membership in the CSCO cannot be done unpublicly. It has to be done in public because you're declaring a position. Now, why did Armenia have to freeze its membership in the CSTO? Because the international community, which is basically Western arms market, said, as long as you're a member of the CSTO, Russia has access to your military bases. Therefore, I cannot sell weapons to you. So Armenia would not be able to enhance its security architecture enhance its capacities if it remained a member of the CSTO. So for the freezing of it, therefore, was a necessity. So the risk of remaining in Russia's security architecture was much higher than decoupling and pivoting towards the West because we would not have had access to the amount of weaponry, for example, that we have. And so that has to be a public process. Uh, same with, for example, um, the discourse on uh, why is Armenia, for example, Banning Russian channels, uh, Russian channels, you know, in public, I mean, in public television. Well, because Russia has been implementing a cyber and hybrid warfare against Armenia for the last two years. This is open knowledge. Armenia asked, it warned, uh, you know, it warned the Russians, it begged, I would assume, at one level diplomatically, but to no avail. So you either have to basically uh, address your own strategic interests and a, you know, do to take steps that may be deemed provocative, but these steps aren't happening in a vacuum. These are part of the longer process of Armenia constantly asking the Russians to stop doing certain things. And Russians seem to be indifferent to the Armenian thing uh, uh, approach. <clears throat> so I don't think we need to qualify Armenia's behavior as being risky. It's the opposite. Uh, the fact that Armenia has been very methodical and careful in communicating with the Russians its concerns. Okay, for example, we are being attacked, please come and help. Russia says, I can't do that. Or our borders have been violated, CSTO mandate stipulates Russian to, for the CSTO to take steps. CSTO says, sorry, we can't help. Armenia says, listen, I have an arms contract with you. We need weapons. And Russia says, I'm sorry, I can't provide those weapons. So when you've had a two to four year process, when one partner has abdicated its responsibilities, right, in addressing Armenia's security needs, the pivot then is not a risky move, it's a necessary move. And it's not an abrupt move because it has taken several years for it to happen. So in that context, the risk propensity is much higher for Armenia not to do something than to do it. Dr. Gopalian, CSTO expects Armenia to clarify whether Armenia stays in it or whether Armenia leaves CSTO. What's the wise answer and the wise step at this stage? Where so we have to view that uh, uh, basically um, ultimatum that Russia is presenting to Armenia as form of a political trap. If Armenia says we are leaving the CSTO, Russia would qualify that as in of itself an egregious move and utilize that as a basis for more punitive action towards us. If Armenia says, you know what, this is our decision to make and we will decide when we're leaving and on our terms, if we so do, then we're able to at some point avoid falling into that trap. So the wise move for Armenia would be to say, we are going to continue with this policy because it is in Armenia's strategic interest and we will discuss whether we're leaving or not when the time comes. In that context, the objective here is not to conform or acquiesce to the thing, demands or the propositions being posed by the CSTO, but rather for Armenia to say, we are going to do, the, to do this on our terms. And Armenia has a legitimate basis to do this on its terms because NATO, excuse me, CSTO has fundamentally failed in all of its obligations towards Armenia. So I think this was a strategic move by the secretary of the CSTO to kind of entrap Armenia and then use that as some form of a political red line to say, well, you see now Armenia in essence has become a platform for a transatlantic presence in the South Caucasus and by them leaving the CSTO is precisely the case. Uh, there's also a lot of discussion coming out of Washington in that the United States and the West has in fact warned Armenia not to engage in what we call sort of, you know, the Saakashvili complex. Georgia did engage in the sort of uh, um, misleading assumption that if they take anti-Russian steps and if they provoke Russia, the West would come to its uh, aid. Uh, Saakashvili hedged his bets and he lost. And Armenia is very cognizant of this. In this context, the West has also consistently informed Armenia that should you decide to take specific state, uh, specific actions that may trigger a Russian response, 
do be prepared on how you're going to be able to absorb that response. In that context, if the underlying assumption is that freezing relations is manageable, but leaving CSTO would trigger a response, if you're going to be able to uh, absorb that response, then leave. If not, do not expect the West to come and rescue you. In that context, uh, caution has been uh, uh, recommended to Armenia. And so the fact that, generally speaking, the West has been relatively silent on whether Armenia should leave or not speaks volume of the fact that there's general contentment in the freezing of membership. And when, in essence, you have de facto left it, and that the jour component of it can be a secondary conversation down the line. Let's come to the ground in our politics. The church has set itself up against the state. Does this help build security or does it hinder? I think it is irrelevant to security. It's relevant to the extent that it may create domestic instability, which in of itself could have a multiplying effect. But the fact that we have seen it has not produced the domestic outcomes that the church or those who are supporting the church or basically participating with the church to create domestic instability, the fact that it has cannot produce that result indicates that it has no effect on Armenian security architecture. In that context, the church has never been part of Armenian security architecture. Whether it was during the 1990, uh, excuse me, 2016 four-day war, whether it was in the 2020 uh, 44 day war, or it was a subsequent incursion that we've seen by Azerbaijan. So in of itself, the church has had a very different model, okay, especially under the tenureship of God again the second. The church has been an extension of the oligarchic elite. This is what I call the oligarchization of the church. In that context, the church synchronized its behavior with the patronal system that we had in Armenia. The 2018 revolution obviously ruptured that, but the church was insulated from the democratic reforms that Armenia had because it is a separate institution. And there was a given social contract. The church doesn't interject itself into politics and it maintains itself and uh, its historical relevance, stature, and sort of, you know, uh, uh, reverence that society has for it remains. Uh, that contract is at the verge of being ruptured. The church has been very, very careful in not fully uh, endorsing what's happening, but at the same time endorsing it tacitly. And while society understands what's going on, the church is attempting to give itself some level of plausible deniability. But these developments, this attempt to either rupture democratic secularism or not, uh, is a secondary question. But when we talk about uh, Armenia's security configurations, Unless the engagement of the church produces domestic instability, the church remains secondary or borderline irrelevant to the security architecture. Now, can the church be relevant to Armenia's diplomatic capabilities, which do have some uh, effect on its security architecture? Yes, but as we've seen, the church has been absent with respect to utilizing its international resources and ties on the issue of the prisoners of war, for example. The church has been absent, for example, in providing assistance or support or social services to the over 100,000 uh, Armenian refugees from Artsakh due to the ethnic cleansing. So the church basically has become an institution that deals more with self-perpetuation and preserving its structural elite. Um, and that does not mean that the church can or is a problem for Armenian security architecture, but it can mean and suggest that it could potentially be a problem if it pr promotes or, or basically uh, participates in domestic instability. Thank you one more time for this opportunity. My pleasure. Doctor of Political Sciences Nersesko Palyan sat down with the first analytical tonight.